Okay, we're back to go through Daniel again. This time I'm going to focus on the 69 because there's stuff about it I should have said and didn't. But there's so much about it I still don't understand. So, as usual, this is going to be a really tentative video about the meaning. The only thing that, you know, is pretty much settled about all these videos that I do is that yes meter exists yes it's a real style and for the most part the generic meaning like 49 42 there's so much of it that you can see it being used kinda of like words how do you know the definition of a word you know the defini definition of a word by the way it's used well, we can see how the numbers are used pan Bible so it's not too hard to understand what their doctrinal meaning is and scholars have kind of known that for a long time I mean there's almost nobody who doesn't understand that 40 for example is he is for testing that's the doctrinal meaning of 40 in the Bible you can dispute all you want about whether you think God exists or whether the Bible is really from God or whatever but once you get into its own definitions of its own terms, there's a lot of agreement, even amongst people who have all kinds of different, you know, as it were, faiths. All right. You can talk to almost any Jew. He'll know 40 is the number of testing. You can talk to almost any Christian or almost any agnostic or atheist. And they'll know, oh, yeah, 40 is the number of testing. And it's actually, you know, gotten to be part of the world's culture because so many people are aware of it and they the, the idea makes sense and it's it's something to use as a sort of shorthand well the same thing is true for these other numbers 49 okay but I haven't covered 69 and I haven't covered 58 that much alright and I'm still as I told you in the last increment I don't know what to say so much about 47 I mean, I have some tentative things I've said about it here in footnote F, okay, that it's, you know, time of the Gentiles, and it's minus seven years. And that part of it is okay, because the, you know, Abraham matured for 53.5 years prior to the end of Gentile time. So it is a time that owed the Gentile that's being, that's the seven years is being subtracted from. Daniel's definitely doing that. What else is he doing it with? What else does it mean? I don't know. Okay, but the focus of this video is going to be on 69. The book ended starting with Solomon. Starting when Solomon started to reign, which has to be sort of explained. Going all the way down here to verse 918. Why 918? Why not 919? Why is this period bookended? See, because the bookend means that he's trying to make a point about the time from when Solomon started to rule until this future time, which in the first time track is going down to 388 BC, which is roughly speaking in history, um, you know, considering the man of time is Greece at that point. We know that's the region of history to look in. And what was plaguing Greece at that point in time, 388 B.C., were the Peloponnesian Wars. So we know he's talking about that because of the man of time in Daniel 2. You know, and then, you know, the later chapters explain later on, and we'll keep on explaining in Daniel 10 through uh, 12, that Greece is the co country in view or the region whose history is in view. Greece giving way to Rome. So it's kind of a no-brainer to know, all right, he's talking about something to do with the Peloponnesian Wars. Exactly what, I'm not sure. Okay. And he's paralleling that period in history with 69 to Solomon. Why? I don't know. I'm going to try and sleuth through some of the variables um, in this video and I have no idea if what I'm going to say is going to be true plausible is as much as I can hope for at this point
you know, because God doesn't give you the whole answer right away. And even if he gives you the whole answer, you're supposed to think it through yourself. That's all I'm really doing in these videos. It's kind of like my own due diligence. And then if God uses it with somebody else or you want get something through it also, that's from him to you, not from me to you. I'm doing this because I need to do it for my own due diligence before him. Okay, so in no event am I trying to sell a position. I'm taking one. But I'm not trying to sell it. All right, so what's the story here? Why 69, first of all? Because it's not divisible by 7. Okay, because it's a year short of something that is divisible by 7, it's kind of pointed sarcasm. It's like, it's like saying that Solomon fell short. And Asa, too. Asa had a lot of good years. He had 30 good years. See, that's 30. That's the period of his good years. Up until his 11th year, he was sort of under somebody else. Solomon himself, up through his fourth year, was kind of, how do you want to call it? God told David, I want Solomon sitting on the throne. David says that, and you know God says that in 1 Chronicles 22. But then as you'll see in that same chapter, David says, well, but you know, I don't really want to give up the throne. Solomon is young and inexperienced. That's David's excuse. You can tell he's going out of fellowship with God at that point. And what ensues is a sort of little mini civil war over whether Solomon or that other guy, what was it, the, the Absalom, was it Absalom, who should sit on the throne. So there's a mini civil war that goes on then. And so the first crowning of Solomon takes place at Gihon. And then after the civil war, the minor civil war, because David ends up getting involved because Bathsheba goes to him and Nathan goes to him. David gets back involved again. He was sick during this time. That's a, the first Kings one. And he finally gets involved and Solomon gets crowned a second time, roughly seven years, not quite seven years later. Um, and there's, a, you know, still some trouble even after David dies for the next three years after David dies. So the temple doesn't get started. All right, and you read all that in First Kings one through First Kings six one, and scholars just don't read it right. I don't know why. It's really obvious and pointed. First Kings six one is telling you David would have been eighty years old. I don't know how come they missed that. I don't know why the hell they used Josephus. Josephus couldn't get the numbers right if he tried. Josephus's numbers are famously wrong you know, and everything he writes. So, you know, why are people listening to Josephus instead of the Bible? I don't know. But the Bible here, Daniel, is accounting Solomon's reign as short. The vote short. It's 69 versus 70. So that's a pointed, satirical, you know, what do you want to call it? Disapproval. That you can say for sure. Because 70 is the voting period of history. Okay. So what is it about this being 69, starting in 970 AD when he started to rule solo? Okay. What is that compared to here, this voting period? Of course, the fact that it is a voting period. All right. It's starting during the voting period. The voting period of history that started here was 10 years prior, 466, 467, depending on how you count the fiscal. So since this is vote short 69, and he's paralleling it or ending the paragraph at a voting period, and the 42 is ensconced inside it, what does that tell you? He's telling you something about trends of history. That's as much as I know right now. 
That has got to be what he means. He's got to be making some kind of historical parallel to Solomon, or he wouldn't benchmark it like this. But what? What is the historical period parallel? I mean, there's a lot of things you can say about Solomon. So what? Peloponnesian Wars, because that was essentially Greece fighting with Greece. And that was pretty much how Solomon's reign got started, is that everybody was fighting against him. There was a sort of war of accession. In the Peloponnesian Wars, you could argue with that, because you got Sparta versus Athens, and then who's going to take sides with Athens, and who's going to take sides with Sparta? That's pretty much how it went. Is that what he's all he's trying to say? Probably not. There ought to be more. Okay, so what is it? Well, this is Solomon through Asa. Okay, from Solomon to Asa. Well, you got Solomon dies, then his son Rehoboam gets on, and Rehoboam was a real jerk. But because of Rehoboam taking over, Israel split up into Israel and Ephraim a.k.a. Judah and Israel, okay? But Ephraim, um, it, it wasn't really Ephraim, but it was northern, okay? That's a kind of split up as a, like a civil war in that sense. And the Peloponnesian Wars were the, you know, varying and Greek city-states going together and splitting up and going together and splitting up, that kind of stuff. So you can say, okay, well, there's a parallel there. Why? Why is he making that parallel? What's the import between the parallel that you can say, okay, well, those are two parallels that both periods have in common? What does that have to do with the text of 9-7 going all the way through 918. I don't know. I mean, the text is very repetitive, okay? High were bad we sent. High were bad we sent. And he's saying it over and over, but each time he says it, he's counting syllables for each of the kings, okay? And then he's splitting the verses into kind of like, good and bad periods. He's lumping Solomon with his son all the way through Asa's 11th year. I'm not sure why he's doing that. I can be sure that he's doing that because of the syllable count. And then, you know, when you go to read this and you go to read this this footnote E, I actually plot the syllables and the verses in Kings and Chronicles that he's talking about. So you can look up those verses yourself and decide for yourself what it means. Okay, but even if you do that, I don't know how that, going all the way down to verse 18, ties to Greece and the Peloponnesian Wars, other than what I just told you. It's a time of, you know, um, them getting together and them separating. You know, in what conglomerations of what parts of what Greek city-states agreed with each other or fought with each other during this period of time. Because this is basically the period of transition where Persia basically stops being Suzerzane. So, you know, at the beginning of the period, what Persia was basically doing with the Greek city-states is that um, it had already lost at the Battle of Salamis. That was 480. And that's where the story of Esther begins. And as a result of that, what happened, the, the, the rulers after Darius the Great, what they started doing is they started playing with the Greek city-states, and they would financially back one against another in order to keep them warring with each other. And that would keep Persia from getting invaded. That was basically what Persia wanted to do. Okay, is, is they played a money game. And that's kind of like what the United States and the Soviet Union did with third, third world countries like Vietnam and the Dominican Republic and stuff like that, is they fought their wars against each other by using third parties. 
That's kind of what Persia was doing. Is it would back one part of Greece in order to fight another part of Greece so that the two parts fighting each other in Greece wouldn't be looking at Persia and Persia wouldn't have to spend so much time and money defending itself from the Greeks. Okay. Now, is that what Daniel is doing prophetically? Is saying, well, see, this happened already, and it did, in the time of Solomon through Asa, that was happening. Northern Israel was used by Assyria to try and, you know, what do you want to call it, become a puppet state. And then Assyria was using northern Israel to try and get northern Israel to turn against Judah and destroy Judah, because Judah was characteristically had more believers in it who were stronger in faith even though both polities were pretty much what do you want to call it apostate that's the norm Christianity is no different today 98 percent of Christianity is totally apostate okay it could be 95 percent in a good year when there's a lot of faith in Christendom it might be 90 percent is apostate it's never a good high percentage of growing believers. The, the, the percentage of believers who are apostate is always somewhere in the vicinity of 90%. Well, that was true back here, too. Is that what Daniel's trying to say? Is high when the apostasy is high, which it characteristically will be, then you're going to have a pol political situation during a voting period for believers that is like Greece and the Peloponnesian Wars, where you had some country outside of Greece trying to get the Greeks to fight with each other. Where you had here, Assyria, who was outside of Israel, trying to get the Jews to fight with each other. Well, those parallels exist. That doesn't mean that that's the parallel Daniel intends. I'm just talking out loud here. I really don't know. But it those ideas tie to vote short. And the idea here doctrinally would be, you know, continuing on as if what I've just told you is true, that that's what's going to happen for Christendom also. Is that to get us all fighting with each other and looking at each other and talking about how each other is wrong or right, rather than looking at the word. Do you just look at God? Do you just look at the Word of God? Do you just want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Or do you want to spend all your time beating up on how the other denominations are wrong? Now, there's a time and place for having to say that somebody's right or wrong. But at some point, you either, how do I want to call this? You either get off God and get transfixed and fixated on who's got it wrong, or you get tired of saying who's got it wrong, and you go back to just looking at God. Is that what Daniel's saying here? Because notice it's vote short by one year. Like, you know, people almost voted for God. Enough people almost voted for God. Well, but if they stopped short, it means they got their eyes on people and things, on each other. The Jews looking at the Jews and, you know, aided and abetted, in this case by Assyria, on the outside. Like the Greeks looking at the Greeks, aided and abetted by Persia on the outside. Because Persia was weakening Persia had her own little civil wars to worry about, and so she used her money to pay for Greeks fighting Greeks. That's what this whole period is about. That's why you had the Peloponnesian Wars. They were largely funded by Persia. And the Greeks are always fighting with each other anyhow, just like the Jews were fighting with each other up here. So is that what Daniel means? Well. Possibly, it's plausible, given the numbers, but if that's true, then why is the text from 9-7 to 9-18 being blocked? Why is he doing that? 
what can I look at the text and see some kind of either corroborative or elucidating meaning to the idea I just you know fleshed out for you the answer is I don't know the text is so repetitive I'm not sure that I can go look at it and say oh see well this is the parallel that he means right now my brain is out I don't know okay but maybe you'll know maybe God will give it to you because right now I don't know so much for 69 and 69 which is here and here and the big conundrum for me is how can I prove the text from 9 7 to 9 18 is actually referencing the stuff I just said the answer is I don't know I can do that so then it's up for doubt whether or not it means what I just said in the next increment I'm going to come back with something a little easier to prove which is the significance of the 258